wonderful to be here on yet another Lord's Day. Um, you know, um, a lot of our women may be out, but y'all sound good out there now. You know, they, they carry us a little bit, but we're so thankful for you all worshiping as you have on this morning. And we thank the men um, who have led us in our worship, our communion thoughts. Um, we are so grateful of that. Um, and you know, we're grateful, we're thankful for our women as well. You know, we do miss them, of course, but I was thinking um, this weekend that I am so happy that our congregation provides um, opportunities for our women, our men, anyone to just get away, have a retreat, be spiritually energized, be spiritually renewed. That's something to rejoice about. We're gonna talk yes. about joy on today. We're so thankful for our leadership providing that opportunity and praise be to God that we have the means to be able to do that as a congregation. Um, I'm very excited about the, uh, the church retreat, retreat on next year, Lord willing. Um, and you know, the men, we have a retreat coming up on this weekend that's going to rival the ladies retreat. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to have a great time nonetheless. Um, it's going to be spiritually refreshing. And our leadership is planning a great day for us. And so I'm going to make this um, um, unshameful plug. Uh, if you are a man and you are interested in joining us for our men retreat, please sign up. We would love to see you, love to fellowship with you. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of great things to come out of that day. Um, so enough about that. Uh, let's get to what we've come here to do on today. Um, let's go to God in prayer before we begin this morning's lesson. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our God, we just thank you so much for being our God, the one true God, the one who sits high and looks low and sees all of our faults, but you know, oh God, all of our needs. We thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you, and we pray that our worship thus far has gone up as sincere, as that it, we pray that it's been um, uh, gone up as a sweet smell of aroma to your nostrils, and we pray, dear Father, that uh, we may be able to dedicate all of our worship unto you, oh God. We just thank you so much once again um, for, for the opportunity that we have to, to study uh, thus saith the Lord, and we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be acceptable unto thee. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and be turning to um, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Um, you've heard it said before that joy is based on our circumstances. Most dictionaries define joy as a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. And have you ever witnessed people spending money on, on their material things and experiences all in the pursuit of making them happy? You know, but, but inside, they are empty. They are impoverished. They are solemn. You see, happiness... It's just an outward expression while joy is an inner feeling, as one writer declared. You know, normally during BBS, what, what's one song that we sing that's related to this subject? I hear it. I hear it. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my what? Now, 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 the audience asks where, right, during that song. It does a singer reply down in my bank account? Does he reply down in my fancy house or fancy car? Or does he respond down in my material possessions? No, he says, I've got the joy down in my heart. You know, another person said, joy is not in things. It is in us. Joy is something that we feel on the inside, and it's meant to remain there. As yeah. Christians, we are called to have a joy that sustains us. Galatians 5, 22, and 1 John 1, 4. It's not based on our physical circumstances. We are spiritual beings. Amen. We're spiritual beings. As, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, our citizenship as Christians is in heaven. From which we await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our citizenship is. So, therefore, our joy comes from up above. Amen. That's why this same Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, said in Philippians 4 4, rejoice in who? Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Again, I will say, doubling down, again, I will say, rejoice. Our joy also comes from knowing who we are, 
and appreciating the grace that has been afforded to us by God. Now, due to these circumstances, our joy should be unwavering and unenduring. James 1, 2 and through 4. As Christians, the Lord desires us to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which includes joy. Encountering brethren who are constantly negative and always seem unhappy, it can be <laughs> discouraging, right? And it can be discouraging. Because, be, perhaps it is because they don't recognize, they don't realize, they don't appreciate the inexpressible joy that has been given to us, that's been afforded to us by Jesus. Christians should be the most joyous people on planet Earth. Yeah. When folks see you, they should know that you are full of joy. They should ask, what the world is wrong with you? When your world is turned upside down, you still have joy? Why should we be the most joyous people on planet Earth? Well, it's because we have justification through Christ. We have oneness in Christ, and the promises of God are a yes in Christ. And if you didn't know already, that those words uh, spell out the word joy. It's the acronym for joy. As my good friend and our brother Eric Owens once noted, the, one of the major reasons why Christians are not more joyous, don't miss this, one of the major reasons why Christians are not more joyous is because we've been here too long and we've started thinking like the natives. We've started thinking like those who are worldly. We've started thinking like those who want to make this world their home. We've started thinking like those who care more about their material possessions rather than the pursuit of God. As I mentioned before, we are spiritual beings. This body, this body is just a tent that, that hosts our spiritual man. This world is not our home. We cannot stay here. So we must be careful when we let this world dictate our joy and happiness. We can't get an everlasting joy that comes from this world. We just cannot. The joy that comes from the pleasures of this world are temporary. But the joy that comes from above is everlasting. It is everlasting. So this morning, I want to impress upon your minds three reasons why we should rejoice as Christians, and then the lesson will be ours. If you are joyless, then hopefully this will encourage you to be joyful. And if you are cheerless, then my prayer is that you will become cheerful. So as I mentioned, go ahead and meet me in Romans chapter 4. We want to talk about how we should rejoice because, number one, we have justification in Christ. Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 23. Verse 23, we read, but the words, and I'm reading from the ESV, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for our hours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses, and raised for our justification. Now, this chapter speaks to the unwavering faith of Abraham, who believed God was going to do what he said he was going to do and make good on his promises. Abraham's faith moved him to obey God, which is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Or some of your translations may say, uh, reckon unto him for righteousness. His faith was so great that it was counted by God. It was counted by God. Now the scripture suggests that we as Christians ought to emulate this kind of faith. One that is active and one that's obedient. We're studying the book of James in our adult Bible class. Uh, and, and if you know anything about James chapter 2, we understand that faith without works is dead. You say you have faith, show me your faith. What are you doing in pursuit of your faith? Are you moving? Are you active? Or are you just standing by, waiting for someone to do what God has told you to do? Abraham did not do that. No, he moved. When God said move, he moved. That is why 
his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Now, as Abraham was justified by his faith, so will we. The word, the word justification is translated diakosis in Greek, and it means the act of God declaring us free from guilt and being made acceptable to him. It's the idea that man has been acquitted of his guilt by God. Amen. All of the transgressions, all of the shame, all of the guilt, we are justified by Christ and acquitted of all of those negative offenses that we have committed to our Almighty Father. In Galatians 5, turn your Bibles there. Uh, thank you, Brother Donald, for reading this text. In Galatians 5, starting at verse 19, Paul provides a catalog of abominations that prove why justification is important and needed. Meet me in verse 19 of Galatians 5. Galatians 5, starting at verse 19. The Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes thusly. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, evil, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before. Listen to me, the Apostle Paul said. I've already told you about these things, but I'm making a double emphasis on it. It's important that you pay attention. I've told you these things before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. As mentioned in this text above, those who pursue the desires, the lusts of the flesh are not walking in the spirit. And just, just because you, you, the sin that you might struggle with, all right, is not mentioned in this text, don't think you're getting off scot free. <laughs> Don't think you are getting off scot-free. You know, the, the, the Apostle Paul, he made sure to cover all his bases when he said things like these. We know that God does not approve of those who continue to engage in immoral behavior. We know, unfortunately, the terrible fate that awaits those who refuse to listen to lie and reason and obey God in faith. If they continue to wallow in their sin, if we continue to sin, then we will be forever separated from our almighty God, Isaiah 59 too. But he does not want that for any of us. He does not want that for us. Despite ourselves, he wants us home with him in heaven. He still wants to have a relationship with us uh, despite our sins, therefore, out of his abundant love for us, his abundant love for us, he sent Jesus to bear our guilt. He sent Christ to bear our shames. He sent the Messiah to atone for the entire sins of the entire world. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on Jesus going to the cross to die for our sins, and rightly so, it was at the cross. Yeah. It was at the cross where the sinless Lamb of God, where he shed his blood for the remission of my offenses, for the remission of your offenses to God. It was at the cross. And the apostle John wrote in Revelation 1-5 that Jesus freed us from our sins by his blood. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that the resurrection the resurrection of Jesus is equally important. Yes. You know, you, you, you've, heard it, you've heard me say before that if Jesus had not walked out of that grave in three days, then Christianity would be a waste of time. Yes. What we are doing here would be all for naught, right? And Jesus wouldn't have been considered like he is in Islam, just a good man. Just a good man. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Notice verse 11. And notice what God accomplished through Jesus Christ. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, 
that is not of his creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but, but by means of his own blood, the securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled persons with the ashes of the hyper sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Listen, after his resurrection, Christ went home to heaven to offer his blood sacrifice to the Father to atone for our sins as the high priest. He is our high priest. Now those who have faith in him are justified. Amen. Praise be to God. You don't think there's power in the blood? You don't think there's power for the blood? Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Because it has washed me white. It has made me whole. Our guilty past sins. Because we have been justified, our guilty past sins have been canceled. Our debt has been paid. That's something to be joyous about, Christians, that, that there is no other religion that can offer this kind of justification. There's no other religion that can do that for us. Not Islam, not Buddhism, not Confucianism, or any other ism that we want to think about. Yeah. If the thought of being justified in Christ does not make you happy, does not make you rejoice, then I don't know what will. When you became, a, before you became a Christian, someone had to tell you that there is a man named Jesus who despite yourselves came into this world and then 2,000 years ago, he decided to do something about our sins by offering himself up on the cross, shedding his blood, raising, and going back home to the Father, and now as, as he sits at the right hand of God, reigning as our high priest, he says, you are not guilty. All right. Amen. You are not guilty. You are not guilty. You know, because of our justification in Christ, but notice the comparison. It's like a convicted felon having his criminal record wiped completely clean as a result of the grace given to him by the image. You know, that individual was headed nowhere fast. Have y'all seen the movie Just Mercy with, with Jamie Foxx? It, it's, a, it's based on a true life, real life story. That movie made me cry. I tell you. I know I'm a big man, but I, I shed some tears. I do shed some tears. That movie didn't make me cry, but you know what? The, the, the thrust of the movie was about a lawyer who was all about trying to get inmates um, off of death row. And he, he, he has spent his entire life's work trying to get those who have been castigated by society, mostly those who are black, African American, African -American yeah. right? And trying to get them off of death row um, when they've committed crimes that are not worthy of them being there in the first place. Now, this convicted felon who was headed for death row, they escaped the clutches of execution. And they walked out of the courtroom justified. Imagine the joy that he or she felt because of that result, right? Because of the grace given to him. Don't you know that in the spiritual sense, that's where we were headed before we became Christians? Right? You know, I, my Bible tells me in Romans 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. But, the, but, but, but we have a free gift through Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not something that we earn. That's grace, folks. Yeah. That is grace. We have a new lease on life. We ought to rejoice knowing that God saw us. He pitied us and decided to justify us through Jesus Christ. So we rejoice because we have justification in Jesus. Outside of Christ, you cannot get this justification. That's something to rejoice about. Number next. 
Another basis of our joy is our oneness in Christ. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And meet me in verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into, see that prepositional phrase, into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all, what? One in Christ Jesus. Now the context of Paul's writing is Christ breaks down any kind of division that exists between man. Ephesians 2.14. Our faith in Christ is what unites us. It's what makes us all one, which is exactly what he prayed for. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in John 17, verses 20 through 21, understand the emphasis, the emphasis of this. Jesus had you and I on his mind the night before he was to be crucified. Isn't that something? Isn't it? What a marvel thought that Jesus asked for us to be one before he was to be betrayed and before he was to die for the entire for the sins of the entire world. Do you not think that unity is important to him? It absolutely is. This is especially important in a world where people are so focused on rank and status. They're worried about the idea or the acclaim that goes with the, the rank and status. They're worried about stepping over others so that they can be number one. But in Christ, that is foolishness because we are all one. Yeah. We are all one. And so in our context, we still live in a country where so many folks think that, that in order to be superior to one another, it's all to, to someone else, it's all about my skin color. My skin color is that which makes me superior to you. Well, let me tell you, God does not care about that. Amen. We are still fighting the ubiquitous sin of racism even today. In our society, you know, Brother Robbie Eversall did a fine job on the topic, Save the Serve Despite Partiality, when he was here for our revival. Amen. I appreciate him for that. I love that, brother. And then this lesson emphasized that our Lord is impartial. Is that not what we talked about in Bible class on this morning? God is not a respecter of persons. He is impartial. Our skin color does not matter in his eyes. It is something that we can get hung up on, right? It is something that we all can get hung up on. But when you cut me open, we're all going to bleed the same color. Amen. And that's red. That's red. You know, I'm joyous because of our status in Christ. Right? It, it, it's, it's Jesus Christ that unites us. Our standing in Christ is what makes us fun. It makes us whole. Th this reality does not happen outside of Christ. It does not happen. It will not happen. In Jesus, we share a commonality that is worthy of rejoicing about. It is. This oneness that we have in Christ is something that, that the world can't take from us no matter how hard they try. No matter how hard they try. You know, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I'm a better man. I'm a better man because of the unity that I have with you all. We rejoice in God giving us the wonderful opportunity to, opportunity to be one with each other. That's why when I don't see my brothers and sisters here, I worry. I am concerned because I feel like a piece of us is missing. A piece of the puzzle is not here, right? As family, we are all considered to be one. Yes, we may have our issues. Yes, we, what family does it? What family does it? But it is what it is Christ who unites us. I firmly believe that because of the blessing, because of the treasure, because of the promises that we have in Christ, the family of God is the best unit on planet Earth. I firmly believe that. God has placed my brothers and sisters in my life. 
for someone, for some folks that I can lean and depend on. I can have a shoulder to cry on when I'm hurt. You know, I, I can have someone to go to. I can have some folks to go to when I am in need. Right? I can have some folks to worship with in unison and, and sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs unto Almighty God. We can have folks to, to worship and, and, and serve together. Right? God knew what he was doing when he placed us together. We have each other to struggle alongside one another on our way to heaven. God knows that we need help on this side of life, which is why he placed each and every one of you in my life, and he placed your brothers and sisters beside me. Amen. He made us one to share in one another's burdens. If that's not something to rejoice about, then I don't know what is. I don't know what is. You were there for me when I lost my family member. You were there for me when I was down and out and lost my job. But I know many of you can say the same thing. Why? It's because we are family. We are empathetic. We, we, we have sympathy. And we care for one another. Yeah. We are one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now, on the flip side of that, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that every Christian who has been baptized in the same blood of Jesus that we've been baptized in, rejoices over our unity, rejoices over our oneness in Jesus Christ. There is still division in the Lord's church, and we can do something to improve this. There is still division in the Lord's church because some of our dear brethren are thinking and acting carnally. I don't want you to think that this is some utopia because we still have some things to fight. Absolutely, they're thinking and acting carnally. As I mentioned, we are spiritual beings. Nonetheless, if everyone who wears the name of Jesus, everyone who wears the name of Christ, focus on what makes us what makes us one, focus on what unites us rather than what makes us different. I believe there will be more calls, there will be, there will be more occasions of rejoicing. I truly do. There are folks who have left the Lord's church because of division, because of uh, this fracture, or because of opposition, because they just don't feel like they are part of the family. And the day that we start doing that to folks who come inside our walls and folks who want to become Christians, shame on us. Shame on us. We may not be dealing with this issue now, but I'm here to warn you, I'm here to tell you that we should not ever, ever, ever Ever treat folks partially. Amen. Amen. Every New Testament Christian has been baptized into the same blood of Jesus, and every New Testament Christian has been made members of the same body, 1 Corinthians 12 and 12 through 13. And all of us who remain faithful to Jesus, faithful to God, will receive the same reward in heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse. Seven, I have fought the good fight. Yeah. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He said something about what saves always saves, right? You've got to keep the faith yeah. if you want to have the reward. Paul said, I've kept the faith. It's for, therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day. And not, not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. The reward is for all of us who remain faithful unto God. We all will receive the same reward. No, we're not talking about a pie in the sky yet. Yeah, Jesus said that we, he, he's uh, preparing mansions for us, but your mansion is not going to be bigger than mine. All right. <laughs> we all will receive the same reward yeah. as long as we remain faithful in Jesus Christ. We, sh we will, we shall rejoice because of this circumstance. We have oneness in Christ. So, 
Why should we be joyous as Christians? Because we have justification in Christ. God's promises, uh, I'm sorry, but we have oneness in Christ. And next, God's promises are a yes in Christ. As we get ready to conclude, have you ever made a promise that you could not keep? Hmm. Or has someone ever made a promise to you that they couldn't keep? I, when I was growing up, and I'm still growing up, I was taught that your word is your bond. Right. Your word is your bond, and that's especially true when you make promises to your children. I'm learning that day by day. You know, I may tell my son, Nico, hey, we're going to get some ice cream. Um, and I just do that sometimes just to keep him quiet, right? And then when we get home, he's like, ice cream, Dad. Ice cream, man. He's not going to be quiet when he's going to uh, hook up on sugar. But you know that that's just something that we uh, continually learn as we are going throughout this world. Keep your promises. Keep your promises. Oh. Keep your word. In the movie, say to Mr. Banks, Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks, he plays Walt Disney. He says, a man, a man cannot break a promise he's made to his children. Mm -hmm. No matter how long it takes for it to come true. Mm -hmm. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, will never renege on His promises That's He's right. made to His children. Right. We can be assured that He's going to come through on what He said He was going to do. That is something to rejoice about. Amen. Notice in Numbers 23, verse 19. Numbers 23, 19. Notice what the prophet Balaam said about the nature of God. He said, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So in our Christian context, the promises given in, of, of God, given in Christ, they are true, they are definite, and they are immutable. In 2 Corinthians, one of the last texts that we'll consider on this morning, but the lesson will be ours. In 2 Corinthians, starting at verse 1. 2 Corinthians, verse 1. 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Y'all are like, where is that? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 19. The Apostle Paul writes, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, Silvanus or Silas, and Timothy and I was not yes and no, but in him it was always yes. For the prom all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen for his glory. When Paul, Silas, and Timothy were preaching the gospel to the Corinthians and essentially to us, they were not preaching a false message. These things that they proclaimed, they were reliable, and they were confirmed by God by miracles, signs, and wonders. 1 Corinthians 12 and 11 through 12. And just as they were able to partake in the promises of Christ as a result of their obedience to him, so will we. Now, what are some of the promises of God that we have in Christ? With our time, I'm just going to mention a few of them. He's promised to give us hope. Romans 5 2. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. Deuteronomy 31 8 and Hebrews 13 5. He's promised to continually cleanse us from our sins. 1 John 1 7. He's promised to seal us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians 1 22. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us peace and comfort. He's promised to love us. He's promised to always be faithful. And if all that wasn't, wasn't enough, he's promised us all things that were to life and godliness. I can keep going, but you get the point. The promises of God are not nay, but they are yay. So when someone asks you, why are you so happy? Why are you so joyous to be a Christian? You can point to all the blessings, all the promises that we have in Christ. Our relationship with God is what assures us of these promises, and as long as we have this covenant relationship, we should rejoice. We should rejoice. So despite the trouble that enters my life, despite the pain and suffering that I may experience, despite the setbacks that I may experience, and despite losing a loved one, my joy remains because I am standing 
on the promises of God. Yeah. In conclusion, we're, we're living the good life as Christians, y'all. Yeah. We're living the good life as Christians. And it's not just because of the roof that we have over our heads or the clothes that we wear or the amount of money that is in our bank account. It is because of what we have in Christ. It's deeper than any material substance that we can think of. That is why our joy must be deeply rooted in our lives. No wonder. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is something that must be cultivated. The longer that you are in Christ, the more joy that you will have. The, the, because the, the more you will appreciate what you have in Christ, the more you will appreciate your relationship in Christ. This joy must continue to be cultivated. It must grow and grow and grow. Because you understand who you are yeah. in Jesus Christ. My mother, my dear mother, she used to sing this song that included these words, I still have joy. I still have joy. Despite the things that I've been through, I still have joy. So once again, I will leave you with the words of our dear brother, the Apostle Paul, who says, rejoice always. We rejoice because we know who we are and we know what we have in Christ Jesus. It's a joy that the world cannot give us. First Thessalonians 5.16. The lesson is yours. If you are not a Christian on today, then I hope that you've been paying special attention to this small two-letter prepositional phrase that I mentioned today. It's the word in. In. Right now, you are outside of Christ. You are outside of God's protection. You are outside of Christ's blessings. Your soul is in jeopardy. And if you do not do something about your sins today, if you do not do something about your sins today, you will leave here with your soul in even greater peril because every breath that we take is not promised. Now is your chance to be justified in Christ. And you don't have to search far and wide for the answers to what you need to do. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. The Apostle Paul said, For we're in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized, that was the prepositional phrase, into Christ, have put on Christ. If you want to become a Christian today, you must obey the gospel by hearing you already heard that Jesus was a man who came into this world in the 2,000 years ago and died for your sins and mine. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the promises that Jesus says, as long as you put your faith in me, I will be your Lord? Are you willing to confess that he is your, the Lord of your life and repent of your sins? Yeah. Commit to doing what you know is right. And we'll help you. Right. We will help you understand. Absolutely. I firmly understand that more conversions to Christianity is made from the dinner table than is made from the pulpit. So if there's something that have been said that you want more questions about, please let us know. We want to help you understand what it is that you need to do in order to become a Christian. Yeah. And then be baptized. Be baptized. Have your sins washed away in pure water, which is where you contact the blood of Jesus. And live faithfully unto death. As the Apostle Paul said, he's kept the faith. And because of that, he will receive the reward. And that is a promise that is for all of us. Do you want that? Do you believe that? Please respond to the Lord's invitation today. Do not delay. And Christians, if you have not been living a life that you know God has called you to do, living a life that's moral, living a life that is pleasing, of you, that is worthy of your walk in God, please repent before it's everlasting too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pleading with you. Do what you know is right. And as I mentioned to, to, to uh, before, we will help you as well. We will help you as well. Brothers and sisters, we must consider those who are weaker. Mm -hmm. Just because you are a Christian does not mean you are struggling. Mm -hmm. I understand and know that. I'm not naive. Mm -hmm. Please, whatever you need to do, let it be known now. Together we stand and sing the song of the courage.